The following program is sponsored by the friends and partners of Ark World Outreach Ministries and Archangel Production. One word from the Lord can transform your life. Impact with Kevin Greer. Good evening. Welcome. My name is Kevin Greer. and Welcome to Impact. Glad you could join us this evening. Listen, I want to talk to you before we get into the message briefly about what God is doing in the ministry. The Lord is doing great things in the world today. The Bible says in the book of Joel, the second chapter and the 28th verse, that in the last days, God will pour his spirit out upon all flesh. Now, a lot of people interpret that scripture to mean that he was just pouring his spirit out on the church. And indeed, in the second chapter of Acts, when the Holy Ghost fell on the day of Pentecost, that did happen. The Holy Ghost fell, uh, people spoke in other tongues, and the Spirit gave them utterance, and 3,000 people got saved that day. So the Holy Ghost fell that day. But the scripture strictly says that in the last days, I will pour my spirit on all flesh. It was not exclusive to the church, and let me explain what I'm saying. In the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, before Jesus came, the Bible said God used to move on man at different times and in different ways. And so there were various ways that God would move upon man, but the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God was not blanketing the earth. As of the days of Pentecost, God poured his spirit out upon the entire earth. So what does that mean? Is that, mean that means that there's nowhere in the world that you can go and the spirit of God isn't there. And the Spirit of God is dealing with mankind in a way that he's never dealt with man before. I just returned in January, early February, from an evangelistic mission trip in Africa. It was in the Ivory Coast and in Ghana, both countries in West Africa. And God moved in a mighty way, signs and wonders, multitudes being saved and delivered, multitudes being healed, blinded eyes being opened, the lame walking, the deaf speaking, just the power of God moving. And the people's faith was there to receive the anointing. You know, there's a scripture in the Bible where it says Jesus was present and the power of God was present to heal them. There are certain places where the Lord really doesn't move like he can because of people's unbelief. Unbelief really can hinder God. If you read the Bible, it says Jesus in his hometown did not heal very many people. It says sometimes he would lay hand and heal a few, as the Bible said, feeble folk. There wasn't the multitudes of people being saved. It's, and that was because in his hometown, people didn't believe in him. Jesus himself said a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. But in Africa and in places in the third world, the people's faith is lifted. See, God revealed something to me some months ago. He said, listen, faith works when you run out of options. Hmm? Let me say that again. Faith will work when you run out of options. In other words, as long as you think that you've got another option here, then you're really not depending on God. There are some people that their homes are about to be foreclosed on or, or you know, they've got different problems and they've got a backup. So, and they're saying, God, I believe you, but if you don't work, then I'm going to tap into my 401k. Or if you don't work, then, you know, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. And so, especially in America, people really don't fully put their faith in God. And they're double-minded. And this is why the Bible said a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. Don't let that person think that they'll receive anything from God because they really haven't put their entire faith in the Lord. You know, at the Red Sea, there, wasn't a, there, there was no other option. In front of them, there was the sea. On either side, there were mountains, and behind them was Pharaoh. They didn't have another option, a, option, and the power of God moved. So in some of those third world countries, the people walk to the Crusades. They walk there, and they stand the whole time. I mean, there's nobody fighting over a seat. You know, there's nobody, you know, fighting about positions or anything like that. They are hungry for the word of God, and the Lord meets them. And so we're going to these places in obedience to the word of God, where he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So in a few minutes, we're going to give you an opportunity to partner with us. 
um, you know, there's, not everybody can go. You know, there's some of us that, you know, God has commissioned or we have the opportunity to go to various countries. But not everybody can go. But we are co-laborers together. I'll be in Uganda in July of this year in the crusade. In August, we'll be in the Manila, Philippines area. And in September, we'll be in India. And we've got other crusades planned, not to mention the work that we do here. So it takes money to do these sorts of things. And we don't preach for money, but we know that finance is necessary to move the gospel forward. So we're asking that you allow God to speak to your heart and support us in prayer. That's the main thing, to blanket these areas with prayer and that God would be with us as we go forth in his name. But when you see the uh, different appeal that comes up, uh, the appeal that comes up very shortly, if God speaks to your heart, we thank you in advance for your support. God bless you. On July 30th, 2016, on Chicago's beautiful lakefront, we'll be advancing the kingdom of God in an open air gospel crusade. We have a beautiful city, but it's rife with problems. Gun and gang violence, drug addiction, poverty, and just a lot of despair. Now we know the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus said, I come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. The Lord has many souls in this city, and he's not willing that one of them will be lost. Time is running out, and our aim is to depopulate hell and populate heaven to the glory of God. I'll be ministering and worshiping to the needs of the people on that day, and music will be rendering, rendered by the international recording artist and minister, Brandon Roberson. The address is 3900 South Lakeshore Drive. That's at Oak Oakwood Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, right on the lakefront. Service starts at 2 p.m. sharp. Please pray with us as we look for a mighty move of God and a harvest of souls. Going to be, there's going to be a great outpouring that day. Now, we're looking for spirit-filled volunteers and soul winners as prayer counselors, ushers, and other roles for the crusade that day. If you're interested, please call 1-866-727-5561. That's 1-866-727-5561. We'll be looking for you. There'll be meeting and training details forthcoming. But there's going to be a great outpouring of God that day, and we'll be looking for you to join us. I'm going to go right into the heart of the message tonight. Come away with me to the book of 2 Kings. We're going to be talking about the remnant. The remnant. The book of 2 Kings, the 19th chapter, beginning at the 30th verse. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall yet take again root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. So God has established laws, rules, and principles. These are established by God. Now, there's a lot of people that say, listen, we're no longer under the law. And, and that's true. We're not under the Mosaic law. But that does not mean that God does not have laws. God has yet has laws. Now, to prove that fact is, is this. In the book of Genesis, before the law of Moses, before the law and the Ten Commandments was given, in the book of Exodus, there was judgment on the earth. In the days of Noah, the entire earth was flooded by water because of the sin and the wickedness of man. And not too much longer after that, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed by fire. Now, there was no law of Moses, but obviously there still had to be laws hmm? because God would have been an unjust judge to have judged the earth if there were no standards to live by. See, the law of Moses... When people say they're not under the law or they're we're no longer under the law, well, listen, let me give you a news flash. Unless you were Jewish at the time when Moses gave the law and you were a Gentile, if you were a Gentile, you were never under the law. The law was given strictly to the Jews, the law of Moses. But God has broader laws. God has moral laws. Just because we're not under the Mosaic law anymore, God still expects you to honor your mother and your father. Hmm? you're still not supposed to commit adultery. God is still against stealing. He's against murder. 
He's against all of those laws. You still have to abide by the laws of God as they pertain to God and to man. So the laws of God are eternal. The laws of God are forever. Now, one thing about the laws of God, his laws and his word are so firmly established that he doesn't even break them. Come away with me to the book of Titus, the first chapter, and the second verse. God doesn't break his laws, and God does not lie. Titus 1 and 2 says, well, let's start at the first verse here. Paul introduces himself. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God can't lie. Now, there, there are some things that God can't do. Everybody says God can do anything. Well, he can do everything except for a few things. One of the things he can't do is lie. Another thing that God cannot do is break an oath or break a promise. In the book of Hebrews, the sixth chapter, starting at the 17th verse, well, let's start at the 16th verse. It says, for men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing to more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability or the unchangeable nature of his counsel, he confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. So God cannot lie. God set laws before the earth was established way back in eternity. And these laws are immutable. They're unchangeable. It's not like man. You know, we, man creates laws all the time, and they overturn laws because of court decisions. They create new laws that supersede the old laws. And sometimes it's kind of hard to find out what laws in, uh, which is applicable at a, particu at a particular time. Every January 1st, you see a list of new laws that were enacted the year before that are going to be applied to everybody for the next year that's, that's coming up. But that doesn't happen with God. God's laws are established from way back. As a matter of fact, God holds his laws so high that he holds his laws and his word higher than his name. If you go to Psalm 132 and 8, it said that God holds his word higher than his name. So, you know, I read that one time, and I have conversations with God. I'm sure some of you do, too. But that didn't really make a lot of sense to me. And I said, Lord, how can you hold your word higher than your name? And the Lord said, son, that's because my word makes my name. My name doesn't make my word. In other words, his word makes his reputation. God's word establishes who he is. It's just like us. The day you break a promise, the day you say you're going to do something and you don't do it, nobody's going to believe you anymore. So the day that God makes a promise to you and breaks it, then you don't have to believe in him. So his reputation is established by his word. So what does all this have to do with the topic, the remnant? I mean, I'll tell you. From the very beginning, God established a law that on earth, everything that's done has to be done through a man. It has to be done through flesh and blood. That's why when Jesus came, he had to come as a man. Now, you know, one could say, well, why didn't Jesus just do it, everything he had to do from heaven? Why did, why did he have to come down here to an earth? Because there was law, a law established that anything done in this realm has to be done by flesh and blood. That's the way that God established it from the beginning. If you look at the book of Hebrews again, the 10th chapter and the 5th verse, it talks about how Jesus came and why he came in a body. Hebrews 10 and 5 says, Wherefore, when he, Jesus, came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, in other words, you didn't want, but a body has thou prepared for me. He had to have a body prepared for him to come to this earth and operate in the earth realm. The seventh verse says, 
Then I said, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. If you go to John, the gospel of John, the first chapter in the first verse, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In the 14th verse of the first chapter of John, says, and the word was made flesh. So he had to come as a man because that's the rules and the laws that are established here on earth that God established a long time ago, and he will not break. I heard Reinhard Bonnke say one time that, listen, God has got to do everything down here through men. And God uses man power when he works on the earth. But man needs God's power to do it. That's the way it's established. So those established boundaries are set, and that's the way that God has it. Now, this is the thing you've got to also understand. God is a spirit, so he doesn't operate on earth other than operating through a man. Well, Satan is a spirit as well. The devil is also a spirit. So he needs a body to do his bidding here on earth. And he does it to the extent that he influences man, he deceives man, and he'll go so far as possess mankind to get his agenda advanced in the earth. You know, there's a saying that, you know, guns don't kill people, people do. Well, Satan works through people to pull the trigger. So all of the decadence, all of the corruption, all of the murder, all of the, the evil that's done in the world is done through mankind because Satan has to work through a man to do it. Now, there's a couple of things that Satan can't do either. Well, there's quite a few things that Satan can't do, but let me tell you a couple of things he can't do. One thing he cannot do is repent. He had one shot at doing God's will when he was in heaven. He blew it, got kicked out of heaven, that's it. He can never repent like mankind does. So he cannot repent. The other thing that he can't do, however, is violate God's law as it pertains to operation on the earth. So the only way he can do it is through mankind. So God's got to use people, hmm? and Satan's got to use people. So God needs a body on this earth to accomplish his purpose. So we look at a couple of scriptures, and I'll underscore that now. These are some key scriptures I want to go through to make you understand how this all works. You go to the book of Genesis, the fifth chapter, and the first verse. And this is when the children of Israel were in Egypt. And it says, And afterwards Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Now they were in bondage, but God wanted them to do something. He wanted to free them for a reason, for a purpose. If you go to the book of Luke, the 19th chapter, the 29th to the 31st verse, this is when Jesus was about to have his triumphant entry into Jerusalem before his crucifixion. Starting at the 29th verse, it says, And it came to pass when he came near or nigh or near to Beth Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he, Jesus, sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in which at your entering you shall find a colt tied, wherein yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him here. And if any man ask you, Why do you loose him? Thus shall you say to him, because the Lord has need of him. So God needed men or people in the book of Exodus when they were in slavery. The following is an important message from Ark World Outreach Ministries. Today, more than ever, we live in a complex, ever-changing world, but the solutions to life's problems are found in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The challenges of everyday life are always present, but through God's love and grace, you can live a victorious life in Christ. The vision and mission of Ark World Outreach Ministries is to advance God's kingdom one soul at a time. We'd like to take this opportunity to ask you to get involved as we reach the loss for Jesus. To sow a seed of any amount, become a monthly partner or for prayer, please call us toll free at 1-866-327 5561 or write us at ARC World Outreach Ministries, P.O. Box 437390, Chicago, Illinois, 60643-7390. Connecting with us is easier than ever. Like us on Facebook. 
www.facebook.com slash arcworldchicago.org or visit us online at www.arcworldchicago.org to request prayer, partner with us, or find resources designed to help you live a victorious life in Christ. Arc World Outreach Ministries is a 501c3 nonprofit organization under the U.S. Internal Revenue Code. Donations to the ministry are tax deductible in the U.S. only in accordance with the United States tax laws. Impact with Kevin Greer is the broadcast outreach of Arc World Outreach Ministries. Here, that was tied up under the control of another master. So, this is, the point here is this. Number one, God has a plan. Now, the fact that you're bound, the fact that you're not free, the fact that you can't get loose, does not mean that God's plan is altered. God's plan is still in effect. And so his purpose is to accomplish his plan through you, and that purpose was established before the foundation of the world. That purpose was established before you were even born. Let me show you something in the book of Jeremiah, the first chapter and the fifth verse. This is a very profound scripture because it speaks to the fact that God always had a plan for you from eternity. He said to Jeremiah, this is Jeremiah 1 and 5, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. Let me break this down a little bit. This word knew in the Hebrew, which was the original text that the scripture was written in, does not mean merely, I'm familiar with you, or I just knew your name, or I knew your address, or I knew who you were. This word, knew, actually means approved. Hmm? So what God said to Jeremiah was, before I formed you in the womb, I approved you. In other words, you don't have to worry about qualifying yourself. You don't have to worry about going through a gamut of uh, 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 matrices and, 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 and different tests. He said, I pre-approved you. I mean, it's just like, it's just like getting a mortgage. Now, there's people that go for mortgages and they're pre-qualified, which means, well, you know, you might be able to afford this mortgage and your credit score might work, but you're not quite yet fully certified. But then there are other people that go get a mortgage and, and they go to the bank, and when they go out to buy the home, they're pre-approved. In other words, the loan is already granted. That gives them a greater bargaining position, or a greater position of strength. So what God said to Jeremiah was, I pre-approved you before I made you. The second thing he says is, before you came out. Now, before I put you in there, I approved you. And before you came out, I sanctified you. In other words, I separated you. He didn't separate him from the womb necessarily, but he made him different. He made him different than everybody else in the world. Not just different physically, but he set him apart for a specific purpose. And the third thing he did with Jeremiah, he says, I ordained you. Now, this isn't a religious ordination. He didn't get papers, he didn't get a robe, he didn't get a mitre on his head. He was ordained in the sense of being given. This word ordained in the Hebrew means given, as a gift. So to reinterpret this, he says to Jeremiah, which is the same thing he's saying to each of you, before I formed you in the belly, I pre-approved you. And before you came out, I made you different. And I gave you to the world. So this is your purpose that God had in you before the foundation of the world. So he had a purpose for you. So even though in a, this day, at this very hour, at this moment, you may be in a state where you feel like you're bound or you feel like you can't get free or you feel like you're, you're hitting the ceiling or you feel like you can't go anywhere, that does not alter God's purpose for you. That does not alter God's plan for you. See, he's got such a purpose for you that Jesus said, what you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. 
and what you loosed on earth, I'll loose in heaven. In other words, he's given you field authority. See, normally in the military, the folks in the field take authority and they take direction and instruction from headquarters or from the lieutenants or people that actually aren't on the field. But the earth is the field where God has sown you. And he's sown you here for a purpose, and he's sown you here to operate under his authority. And what he says is, I'll take field authority from you. So if you bind it in earth, I don't care what it is. It could be cancer. It could be addiction. It could be salvation. It could be deliverance. It could be whatever it is. If you bind any demon, any force on earth, I'll bind it in heaven. But you do it first. And if you loose anything on earth, anything that's bound, anything that's got you tied up, anything that's got you hindered, anything that's got you bogged down, he said, I'll lose it in heaven. So he's given you the authority. So the children of Israel were bound. The donkey was tied up in these two instances here. But God freed them for a purpose. So you ask me, what does all this have to do with the remnant? I'm glad you asked. First of all, let me read the dictionary definition of remnant. It said a remnant, one definition is, is something that's left over. It's a remainder. Or it could be a surviving trace or a vestige. In other words, everybody around you could be going to hell in a handbasket. Nobody in your family is saved. Nobody around you is saved. All the people around you are, are drug addicts and, and, and alcoholics and, and, and murderers and dope addicts, and they're not... They're not living for God. God wants to preserve you for a purpose. He wants you to preserve you so your light could shine. See, God has stashed away a people. That's what a remnant means. Let me read that opening text again in these last few moments and break this down. Back to 2 Kings, the 19th chapter and the 30th verse. This is the plan that God has for the remnant. It says, and the remnant that has escaped out of the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. So God wants to do three things for you tonight. The first thing he wants to do is to set you free. Now, there's a lot of folks that are bound. They think they're free. They're walking around uh, free as a bird, they think. They can go where they want. They can come when they want. They can talk to whom they want. And let me, to put that in some context, I minister twice a month at a maximum security prison. And there's some men that have been in there for decades. They're on lockdown probably 23 hours a day in an 8 by 10 cell, I think the dimensions are. These men cannot do what they want. Thank you for watching Impact with Kevin Greer, the broadcast outreach of Ark World Outreach Ministries. And remember, one word from the Lord can transform your life.